Yeah, so I think most of you are back in. There's still a few hours. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, for the benefit of those of you who don't know him, I'd now like to introduce our speaker, who together with his uh, wife Sheila, um, we're delighted to have with us. In recent years, we've had speakers eminent in various ways in the cycling world, ranging from Dr. Alex Moulton, who addressed us here in this room uh, in, uh, up in Birmingham, um, uh, to Dave Pitt, the uh, 30 miles an hour tricyclist. But however you look at it, we are extremely fortunate today to have Ted, to people like us who cannot go higher than the president of the Cyclist Touring Club. Ted is a lifelong cyclist, uh, give or take the first seven years, as it says in the um, CDC Cycle Touring when he uh, was first elected as president. Uh, he's uh, been a member of the Rough Stuff Fellowship for about 35 years. He has time trialed uh, and in fact uh, still does all distances up to 12 hours. And of course he tours. Ted's been a member of the Cyclist Touring Club for no less than 50 years. And for all but the first two years of that, he has served on a CDC committee of one kind or another. So he is a fully committed, practical cyclist, and he's given a lifetime of service to the cause of cycling. The whole of Ted's professional career has been in the aircraft industry, which will in fact give him common ground with uh, quite a number of our members. Living at Winterbourne near Bristol, Ted and his wife, Sheila, uh, in fact uh, attended our last two luncheons which we had in Winterbourne. So he's already a well-established friend uh, of the club for most of us. We've deliberately left the choice of uh, topic to Ted to choose, and, but whatever it is, I'm sure it will be very interesting. So, Ted, if you'd... Uh, Kind of to say a few things. <laughs> Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, when uh, Sheila and myself received this invitation <coughs> to come to this luncheon, we were both extremely pleased and very honoured. We're honoured to, to, to be able to come to what is, after all, a unique organisation. And we have uh, as has already been noted, that we have been to two of your previous luncheons. But my first introduction, I suppose, to the uh, veteran cycling world um, came when I was a teenager and riding with the Bedfordshire District Association. Just outside Luton, we had a little village called Diamond End. And at Diamond End was Wally Angels. Now, I don't know how many of you remember Wally Angel. No, I don't. I'm sure you can. <laughs> but, but Wally had what amounted to a Nissan hut there that was crammed full of all sorts of cycling treasures. And every year, on one particular day, our section was allowed to go up to his place and ride these machines in the country lanes around. And uh, I can well remember things like sociables and, and uh, tandem trikes where the lady sat right at the front and you were sitting behind. And I can remember all these things as a teenager. And then I suppose it fell on stony ground for a bit for me. And uh, much later on, I uh, rode a bone shaker in the... Um, Bristol 600 celebrations, starting from Durham, Durham down and coming down into the city. And I re well remember that ride being on what was a bone shaker, um, coming down Union Street in Bristol. And those of you that know Union Street, it's quite steep, quite short, but quite steep. And having wound on the brake 
on the bone shaker, and those of you that are acquainted with that will know that you turn the handlebars and it winds up a string which pushes a, a, a shoe down on the rear wheel. And I accomplished most of that ride down Union Street with the wheel, back wheel locked on its iron tyres, but I got down safely. And that was a, an experience which uh, brought Sheila really into, uh, into the old style bicycles, and she rode a rally cross frame that day, dressed in the correct attire. She loved it so much, she's always been on to me to get a run ever since. Uh, to my shame, I've got two very old loop frame machines in my workshop, which have been there longer than I care to think, and I still haven't restored them. Uh, that's because I can say without fear or favour that since I've retired, I've been busier than I ever was when I was at work. <laughs> there we are. And then I rode, um, a quadricycle with um, Audrey Marks at one of our <coughs> functions, um, and that was quite quite an effort, I recall. Um, particularly when we turned up over the motorway and we got over the top, just over the top. And Audrey said, "We've never ridden that before," and I thought, "No, we ain't going to ride it again." <laughs> <laughs> However, what is it that, that causes us to um, to reminisce and to look back into history? There's no doubt that you know all of us uh, are guilty of this to a greater or lesser extent, uh, and I suspect that cyclists are probably the greatest nostalgia buffs there are going. Um, if our Thursday group that I ride with is anything to go by, it's certainly very true because every time we stop for lunch, out come old photographs, and it's do you know where this is, and do you remember so and so, and so it goes on, and we have a number in our in our group that are now 80 years plus still riding well and do have a tremendous memories. So yes, nostalgia is one of the great things, I suppose. Um, inevitably, of course, the good times are always, the good times they were were always better than they were when you're remembering back. And I suppose the bad times were always leavened with some sense of humor, which probably at the time was not considered funny, but now is. And that, I suppose, is the great thing about human beings generally. We can uh, switch off certain areas and still enjoy what we remember to be the good times. However, the collection, the collectors of past, and you'll forgive me for reading this a little bit, <coughs> past engineering and human endeavor do have a more factual material with which to savor the past. The veteran motor car and motorcycle people the, the, the steam preservation societies all have engineering feats that they can look back on and indeed restore and help to savour the past as, as they <coughs> hoped it was and not necessarily perhaps as it often was. But of all those, of course, looking back at those, the Shuttleworth Trust in Bedfordshire endeavours to combine aircraft, motor cars, <coughs> bicycles, anything of that type which goes along with the particular aircraft that they happen to be showing. And then last but not least, of course, yourselves, the Veteran Cycle Club. But why do we collect, restore, and yes, venerate these examples of bygone years? Is it because we are fascinated by the sheer inventiveness of the creations, and some are indeed masterpieces of, of imagination and optimism, Perhaps the engineers among us are intrigued by the use to which the limited materials were put to. And when you consider that many of those ideas with modern materials have now come to fruition, it says a lot for the uh, for far-sightedness of those early inventors. Do we have a desire to transport ourselves back to what many, in many people's eyes was a better way of life, a more tranquil and gracious period? Those were the days. And re by restoring and using the means of transport and enjoyment, along with others of a like mind, we can travel backwards, if only for a short while, and recreate, as in a time capsule, the lifestyle of our chosen period. I say short while because no, knowing that most people that endeavor to restore machines of any sort, the short period 
that I'm referring to is when they're on the road. The long period is that they're usually at it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And so a lot of wives, which I'm sure you're not amongst them, regret ever these old things coming into the house in the first place. I said you're not amongst them, didn't I? I wasn't referring to your husbands either. I have Im immense admiration for the physical endeavours and the mental fortitude of the pioneers of those days. I don't honestly think that we can begin to understand just how much effort and courage went into some of the exploits of the early bicyclists. Four years before Stanley Cotterill founded the Bicycle Touring Club, which of course later became the Cyclist Touring Club, a book was published, and doubtless many of you may have read it, Bicycling its Rise and Development, a textbook for early riders. If you haven't read it, you ought to get it. In it are chapters dealing with learning to ride, bicycle uh, records, tourist guides at home and overseas, and a whole host of other little chapters which are an absolute education. <coughs> As an illustration of physical endeavour, a ride from London to John O'Groats was undertaken by four gentlemen of the Middlesex Bicycle Club and the largest 52-inch wheels, and they accomplished the 800 miles in 14 days, averaging 60 miles a day. Now that feat is not bad, even at today's standards. But when you think how many modern cyclists would take tackle that ride with a single gear of 52 inches, Think about that, let alone a 45 inch one. But it doesn't end there. Compare the road conditions. I quote, the roads were shockingly bad. What with the rain and the thunderstorms, the mud clogged about the wheels, which had to drive a path through the slime. Yeah, some of the roads are getting like that again, aren't they? But uh, still. <laughs> On arriving in Yorkshire, the members found the roads worse. These roads were composed of a few pieces of stone and a deep stratum of creamy limestone and, that, and were very awkward to travel upon. Something of an understatement, I would have thought. But, you know, it was a tremendous feat. And these chaps arrived in, their 18, in 800 miles and they said 800 miles in 14 days is a pretty good illustration of the practical value of the bicycle. Now, the only thing we have to consider there is how many other people could have done that, I wonder. But then they were athletes of a remarkable type. But I think what comes out of it, of course, is their mental attitude. They were determined to get there and they fought through thick and thin to do it. And I suspect, looking around, that a great number of us here today try and, and indeed do, relate possibly to the sort of chaps and ladies that were about in those days. A wonderful, wonderful set of people. Mm. And again, quoting from this admirable publication, on training, and you'll love this, the athlete will do well to wean himself from the use of tobacco and fermented liquors, <laughs> as both should be prohibited when regular training commences. This one, would appeal to my wife and doubtless to a number of people like her. It should be a rule that no attempt should ever be made to wake a man or woman in training at any fixed hour. <laughs> <laughs> the duration of sleep must be left entirely to the demands of the system and should not be interrupted, however long it may continue. <laughs> now, if you, if you have a wife like I've got here, if I don't interrupt her, she'll sleep for the rest of the day as well. <laughs> I'm sure there are others. <laughs> On overtraining, when this condition occurs, rest and port wine should do wonders. <laughs> I've got a feeling, you know, having read this book, that this smacks very much of middle class, don't you? Because I, I can't, can't imagine that the ordinary fellow in the street in those days could sort of adhere to these instructions. Very, very interesting. A few hints from golden rules for bicycle rides. Never buy a bicycle unless it is of the best quality and by one of the best makers. 
never step out on your, on your machine without taking with you a spanner and an oil tin, in brackets, sperm oil. Never travel a long journey without having your drawers lined smoothly and carefully with chamois leather or buckskin. <laughs> Never fail when resting on a journey to place your machine beyond the reach of meddlesome hands. Nothing changes, does it? It's very true today. In fact, most of those are when you stop thinking about it, except, except the sperm oil, I suppose. We've got a little bit advanced on that now. Finally, on clubs, which in 1874, there were eight listed under Metropolitan Bicycle Clubs and 11 under Provincial Bicycle Clubs. The author submits a suggestion to the bicycling world that a federation of clubs would lead to the substitution of one set <coughs> of rules for the number that at present exist. We would advocate the formation of a central club in London at which members of any country country clubs duly affiliated would be welcome. That was prophetic. The CTC went a long way to achieving that and 120 years on attempts are still being made to bring the cycling movement with all its varying aspects under one umbrella. And you've doubtless probably read in the cycling press and uh, the CTC, CTNC that efforts are still underway to try and bring certain aspects of the movements anyway onto, into one single umbrella. Clearly we are never ever going to, as a cyclist touring club, uh, rule over the racing um, aspect. Neither would the Road Time Trials Council wish to have the BCF running road uh, time trialling. So I think they will continue separately and we as a club, um, when this was first mooted by the Sports Council, the body that got us together uh, last year, uh, we have <coughs> made considerable moves to get the Tandem Club and uh, the other organisations that are, again, separate bodies uh, into that particular um, forum because we feel that uh, they need to have a voice. So, get the cycling movement. Very interesting and, and uh, towards the end a uh, particular thought provoking uh, talk. Um, it's interesting to hear um, what you said Ted about uh, the visit to Diamond End uh, uh, raising your interest in old cycles all that time ago. Because if I remember rightly, and uh, Marion James and, and even Beaumont will correct me if I don't, I think it was as a result of a visit to Diamond End that the brothers Derek and John Roberts um, wrote their initial letter <coughs> to the CTC Gazette of Cycling suggesting the formation of a club for those interested in cycling history and old machines. And it was as a result of that that this club was formed 40 years ago. <laughs>